I want to ask you, Luke, this. So in addition to, like I said, you know, your work uh, with the ACC Network, I know you do radio here in town as well. Um, but as an ex-player and a guy who played for, in my opinion, the best modern X's and O's coach in college basketball uh, that there has been, um, what kind of attributes, I guess, would you say, like if they sat you down, if the search firm and Josh Hurd sat you down and said, give me, you know, five things that you think the Louisville coach needs, what would your answer be? Well, I think number one, you have to have um, really strong recruiting ties in today's environment. You know, I, I don't think you can be, um, you know, singularly focused on one way, the way you used to be able to, you know, when I think about and you built their roster to win a national championship, you know, they went out and got their specific kind of guy and they developed them over multiple years. And then there were these big physical, you know, guys inside and smooth shooters and great passers on the perimeter and, and probably DeAndre hunters that in between, but I don't know how well that works in today's environment of just, Hey, I'm going to recruit these studs and develop them over four years. And when they're juniors or seniors, we're going to win. You know, now it's so easy to hit the transfer portal. I, I just I don't see those guys, especially high caliber players, four and five stars, just sitting and waiting for two and three years before they get the real opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, Steve Forbes is my example there. His JUCO ties and the fact that he's been a, a division one head coach, he has a mix. He can go hit the transfer market. He can go hit JUCOs. He can get guys to develop over time. He's got this wide net he can cast when he's going to look at players. And he's got the evaluation tools from having done JUCO and been at these mm -hmm. lower levels for so long about why guys in with what I'm trying to do now. Hopefully I don't get in trouble. My wife just called. <laughs> That's okay. Um, but um you know, number two, I, I do think you have to be somebody who can face the microphone, the criticism, the crowd, the community. Um, I think that through the ups and downs, even in a program like Louisville, it has all this support, all these resources. Um, you know, having played here, like you said, having been a player, uh, th those were boos early on in my career, missing mm -hmm. shots. Mm -hmm. And championship that year, you know, we did a heck of a lot of winning and I still heard boos. <laughs> So I don't think we'd lost a game and I was still hearing boos. <laughs> I know how fans feel about in, in the Louisville community feel about their basketball program. They're passionate. They're, they have an incredible amount of enthusiasm and they want to win. And so I think a coach has to be very ready for that. You have to have really thick skin, but also be relatable enough to the fans to, to be able to talk to them and show them that you're working on things and you're, you're developing a program, show them what your vision is. Because I think we saw, you know, if you're an old school coach that, you know, kind of tells the media off at times, it, it doesn't really, it doesn't really pay you back. Mm -hmm. You know, that quality in the long run probably hurts you at a place like Louisville. Uh, I think another uh, key in this environment is going out and being able to build relationships with the big booster money. You know, Rick Patino, for example, he had friends of the Ville. And so he invited in all these different wealthy people to mm -hmm. bid on going to games and boxes and private this and dinners, golf trips, things like that, in order to, you know, cultivate money and resources to make his program another level. And so I do think that's part of it. Can you help with name image likeness with your relationships around a community and, and, and build and help these guys feel like they, they can not only make money then, but probably another aspect is how do you help them after, whether mm -hmm. it's into coaching or whatever their next step is. I was a business guy. Um, I know Kyle Keurig got into the business school and, and went through that. So regardless of what your thing is, you got to be able to sell that to, to a, more than one kind of kid, right? I know everybody wants to play in the NBA, but it doesn't necessarily work that way. And uh, probably my my last point is um, is is being that player's coach. I'll just reiterate mm -hmm. that because you know the tough love. I think you're seeing that coaches that are exiting basketball right now are a lot of those old school coaches mm -hmm. that you know mf you and yell at you and get on your case. And, you know, not only were you stuck there, it was just a different time where it was part of it. And I think now you have to, the toughest part, in my opinion, is consistently recruit the kids. 
you know, it's really tough to sit somebody on the end of the bench and not pay attention to them. You know, those guys are going to leave. Mm-hmm. And so you have 10, 11, 12 guys that can play. You have to constantly recruit those guys, even the ones that are playing five, 10 minutes a game. So I think it's really tough. Yeah. And, and, and to your point, I, you know, having those skill sets um, all combined with navigating what has become, I think at times it can get toxic here. Um, but I think the toxicity has a lot to do with just the, the lack of success. I think if the team is winning, a lot of the issues maybe go away. Do, do you agree with that assessment? Like that, that will help a lot? Or, or do you think there's still some work that would need to be done by the head coach, even if they were winning games uh, here in town to kind of soothe some of the frustrations that exist in this fan base? <laughs> winning cures it all, man. <laughs> well, I, I just, um, you know, I think about the, the stuff that I went through as a basketball player, even at L. if we weren't winning, how would I have reacted to it? How would it have made me mm-hmm. feel? And, you know, paying the price only makes sense when you get the reward. And making runs to multiple Final Fours and winning three conference titles and being a part of the winning this class ever at UofL, you know, it was all worth it. I paid a price. I got a big reward for it. And, um, you know, if you pay the price and you feel like you're given everything you have, whether you really are or not, if you feel that way, it's really tough to be consistently losing games, to hear it, you know, because of social media. It's, it, I'm like an old man now, Jeff, because the last of the <laughs> group that, that didn't have it, social media in your face 24-7. Mm-hmm. You know, I had a Twitter, but I never really checked it. I had a, like an Instagram, but, you know, you had a couple thousand people on there maybe. Now these, you know. 50,000, 100,000. If you're Haley Van Lith, you've got hundreds of thousands, a million followers, right? <laughs> they tell you if you're doing good and they certainly tell you if you're doing bad. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, again, not having any pro teams around here, this market, it can just really weigh on you at times um, when you're losing because every couch coach in the community tells you about it with social media. It's in your face all the time. So, you know, I, I think being able to block some of that stuff out helped me but certainly going through a little adversity and feeling like we're the best team in the country, you know, I can handle it. I, I know what the, you know, I, I know I'm going to get something good on the other side of this. And, and part of that is like, you know, part of that is coaching. You know, if Rick Pitino's coached NBA scoring champions and the Boston Celtics and New York Knicks and won championships, if he tells me, you know, I got to go run through that wall in order to win, like, all right, you know, we strap up a little bit. I'm gonna go run through that wall. If a guy who's not proven comes here and says that, you know, you may, you may question some things, but there are, there are pros and cons. You know, I know Kenny Payne's name is thrown out there. You know, if, if you want to be a pro and Kenny Payne says, well, you know, you think your hot stuff is a big man, let me call, you know, Carl Anthony Towns and, and Bam Adebayo and, and tell you how hard they had to work. You know, that's, that's impactful. That's, that's a, a different way of doing it, but you know, you can get your point across that way. Same way when Rick Pitino told me to do something, you know, I was able to listen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that, that's true. Yeah, that, those, those different avenues, but I think could potentially be, um, obviously be very successful. Well, Luke, uh, the last thing then is um, you and I both uh, new fathers. You've got a, a couple months on me, but uh, have you started to sleep again yet? Has the, has the lifestyle returned at least to some normalcy? Yeah, if you ask me in a week, I might change my. Uh, <laughs> but we we're, we're like knock on wood, we're a good weekend with some solid sleep. So I, I love uh, that. Yeah, we, we're once we got through the little sleep regression right at four months, uh, where we were like in a good routine, we felt great, and then just all of a sudden, bam, starts waking up at <laughs> 30 and four o'clock. And so once we got through that, we're we're in good shape now. How about you? Everything good? sleeping uh not yet uh we're told that uh so our kid is four four weeks old now so we're told that this is like the 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 real brunt of the the struggles for the next like couple weeks and then we'll be through it so uh we'll see but luckily as you know it's it's incredibly helpful to have a good partnership uh with your uh significant other so we've done as much as we can to try to alleviate the stress between the two of us but man um the payoff, it, you know what, Luke, 
there you go. There's your a good example. The payoff is worth it. It's uh, to, to see a cute kid and know what you're, that you're doing something positive and good uh, in the world makes it all worth it. So I won't worry about the lack of sleep and I'll just be happy that uh, I got a little one to, to pay attention to and help out. Well, four weeks in, you haven't quite seen it just yet, but just the first time you get home or you come back and your little girl, little boy lights up at you mm -hmm. and all that big gummy smile with no teeth <laughs> that you're there, man. It's like, nah, who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, but uh, Luke, I appreciate your time. I know you're super busy, so I'll, I'll let you get going. But thank you so much for your time uh, and love always having you on the podcast whenever we can get you. Anytime, Jeff. Thanks for having me, man. All right. Thanks, buddy.